Well, g'day, good morning, and welcome to the channel. Today, I've got something very exciting. I've finally got the Canon R7. So it took a little bit longer to get than I expected. It actually had a mishap with the courier. It got delivered to the wrong house. It was a bit of a drama, but I've got it now. This is my very first session. There's a swan right here. I don't know if you can see it, um, just sitting on the water. So we've got a bird to photograph. Um, today's just gonna be about my impressions, my first impressions. This isn't a review. I just wanna use the camera. I'm really excited. I got up really early this morning. I've driven 45 minutes in the dark. I couldn't wipe this smile off my face in anticipation. I'm struggling talking to you because I just wanna photograph this swan. But what I'm gonna do is just have a use the camera, check what the buffer's like, the ISO, you know, just have a play with it and get a feel for it. So for me to review a camera, I need to use it for a long period of time. And that's what I'm gonna do. So my review will be a little ways off. I'm just gonna use it, have some fun and just see what sort of shots we can get and I'll share those with you. So I asked you what lens you wanted me to use today and overwhelmingly you all said the RF 100 to 500, which I have here. Yep, it looks a bit different. It's got this weird camo 3M sticker on it. I'll put a link in the description of where I got it from. So why don't we set up, um, and we'll photograph this black swan. I am here hoping to get sunlight, but there's clouds in the sky, so it's a bit overcast. It might be a good test of the ISO conditions if we can just shoot before that sun comes up. So without further delay, let's get into it. All right, so I'm down by the water's edge. I've got nice and low. You can see that the ground pod, I'll put a link in the description. I've got the gimbal, I've got the 100 to 500, I've got the R7, I've got the monitor so I can record what the viewfinder is happening. I'm nice and low and there is a swan coming directly at us. Now it's overcast, or it's not overcast, the sun just hasn't come up yet. So we've got quite low light. So I'm gonna shoot at ISO 6400 on the R7 and just see what sort of shots we can get. We find it, there it is. 6400, so beautiful looking swan. It's just gliding around. I'll just check my settings. So I'm at ISO 6400. I'm wide open at 7.1 aperture, which gives me a shutter speed of 1 200th, which is quite slow, but you have to go quite slow to keep that ISO in check. Oh, look at that, it's beautiful. And it'll be interesting to see what these turn out like, um, whether they're usable or not. And I will share with them, I'll let you download in the description. I'll give you a link to this file just to see what it looks like. Oh, we're getting some nice color there now. Look at that color in the background. <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh, I'm hitting the buffer. Oh, it, oh that is stunning. So we just had a little bit of sunlight there, which sort of made the bird glow. So I'm also really interested in the buffer. There's been a lot of talk so far about how bad the buffer is on this camera, as in you don't get a lot of shots. So I'm gonna just start off shooting in um, 30 frames per second, electronic and full raw, which has the smallest buffer. I think it's just over 30 something shots. And if I do look on the viewfinder, it does tell us, I think it says 31 um, in the top left-hand corner there. So. 31 shots is not a lot. Um, I just took some shots of that swan and I've hit it a couple of times already. So just something to be aware of when the action's happening, um, you might hit that buffer. Okay, something else that the R7 has is it's inherited the um, autofocus of the R3 and it's slightly different to the R5. And I've currently got it set to, I'll show you, so if I just show you the menu, I've got it set at servo on an AF point. So a single AF point, I've got subject tracking on, animals, eye detection, enable. So with those settings, when I point it at a bird, we can see the little box turn up, which is indicating to us that's what it's gonna track. So if I simply hit the AF on button, it'll just start tracking that subject and I can take the shots, which is quite cool. So you can just put the focus point where you want it 
and then the camera will start tracking it. So we've got some ducks coming over here, so if I put the focus point on there, and it'll just start tracking those ducks, which is pretty cool. So you can see how the camera is already picking up those ducks, telling me what it is, and I just hold down the AF on and it starts tracking. Let's see if it can track past this. Oh no, I got confused. <laughs> So you can see just how amazing the tracking is on these cameras, on these mirrorless cameras, that the focus point just sticks on the duck, which is quite incredible. If we move over here, bang, where are we? There. Where's another bird? There's one way over there, will it find it? Yep. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. That bird's a long way off and it's picked it up. How incredible is that autofocus? That's why you want to go from a 7D or a 90D to the R7. That autofocus is class leading. It's incredible. For birds and wildlife, I don't think it gets any better than that. You can point the camera at a subject, at an animal, and the camera knows and can see the animal and can track it. Like, it's insane. It's just incredible. So I'm just shooting a little bit of video of this coot. So on the R7, we just go from on to video, and then I just hit the record button, and it's recording. So that should look pretty cool. And then I just turn the dial back, and now we're at stills, and we can see, I can drop that ISO down to 3200 now, because we've got much better light. I also need to mention what type of memory card that I'm using and I've been very, very fortunate that I reached out to Prograde, which is a, they create professional memory cards and they were kind enough to send me their fastest SD card and it's very important that you make note of the write speed. A lot of the manufacturers put the read speed, like they go um, 180 or 200 or whatever it is, but if that's irrelevant for us, we want the write speed. So always check the write speed. The write speed of this card is 250 megabits per second, which is one of the faster ones out there. And that enables you to write to the memory card at, and it'll clear your buffer quickly. So just check the write speed of your SD card because ideally you need to have the fastest card you can get. And Prograde have offered a 15% discount uh, through my channel. If you look in the description, you can pick up one of these amazing professional cards. I have purchased these cards with my own money for my R5, so I do like the product and I will promote it because I use it. So be sure to check that in the description. You've got to have a fast SD card so that the buffer will clear quicker. All right, so we're starting to get some sunlight and there's way more action further around. So let's go for a walk. There we go, we can see our swan. That's the uh, mast lapwing coming at us. <laughs> Not too happy. Oh, we've got hard heads. We've got hard heads. We've got hard heads here. Oh, that's nice. So I've changed a few of the settings of how I adjust my ISO and my shutter speed. I like to have the ISO on a dial. So at the moment on the R7 by default, it's got an ISO button. We hit the ISO button, brings up the ISO and you just roll through the dial, the front dial. So you've got to push two buttons, ISO button and then choose your ISO. And I don't like that. I just want to um, adjust the dial so I can adjust the ISO as I'm looking. So I've actually set the ISO to the control dial here next to the thumb and you can see that I can just adjust the ISO now just by turning it, which is, works better for me. And the front dial is my shutter speed, so I can just go darker or brighter just on here. Now you might be going, well, how do you change your aperture? 
well, I can just assign the aperture to the control dial or control ring, sorry, on the lens. And I'm not changing the aperture because it's at 7.1. Um, this lens is sharp at 7.1. I need all that light, so I'm not changing it. So for me, I'm just changing the, the dial for my ISO and the front dial for my shutter speed. And that's all I'm doing. Quite easy to set my exposure. I've got the Swan, set the ISO to 3200. I can just change the dial here, see? 6400, make it brighter. 3200 if I want and then the shutter speed I can just change it until the histogram is to the right hand side that's all I'm doing I'm just literally looking at the swan okay my ISO I can see it's 3200 a shutter speed of 250th which should be fast enough um, and we just put the focus point on the bird and we take photos that's all I'm doing and when this light changes I'm just changing my shutter speed or my ISO um, and that's all I need to do so a fascinating tidbit with the black swan that you might not be aware of, but for whatever reason, there's more males than females. So clearly that creates an issue when it comes to breeding. And what's ended up happening is males form a pair bond. So two males become a pair, and then they find a female and they mate with that female. She lays those eggs. Once she's laid the eggs, the two males drive the female off. The males adopt the nest and those two males will raise those chicks to maturity. So it's fascinating really, isn't it? And very interesting. I feel a bit sorry for the female, I must admit. So I've just shot at ISO 800 at 1 60th of a second, <laughs> which is very, very slow. But you know, that's often what we have to do to get that um, ISO down if you're worried about it, is we just have to have low shutter speeds and there's no other way to get around that. So we've got some uh, noisy miners feeding in these eucalypts and they're just lurping, I think. They're just getting these little lurps off the leaves and they're flying around, so. That's why they call them noisy miners. <laughs> just want to get them a bit lower if we can. That's better. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so we managed to get some shots. It's dropped down low. Oh, so the battery's just died. So I've been shooting for a couple of hours and the battery's just died. So I have to quickly change the battery. Morning. Yeah. Two owls in the tree over here. Are they, are they still there now? Tawny frogmouth. In this tree here? Yeah, they breed during the spring and they always spend all these things in the same breed. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Not a Beautiful spot, that's for sure. So I've just been photographing the um, noisy miner and a member of the public's come up to me and let me know that there's a pair of tawny frogmouth just uh, resting in a tree. They're a little bit high up, but they, a lot of people refer to them as owls, but they're frogmouth. So I might just go and show you a bit of video and take a photo of these <laughs> pretty cool little birds that we have in Australia. So there's two tawny frogmouths up in this tree just resting, <laughs> pretty cool. Very cool. So after the frog mouths, I went and filmed the outro, pretty happy with how the morning session had gone. When I was driving home, I actually spotted a huge flock of sulfur crested cockatoos feeding in a field. I've quickly pulled over, grabbed my camera, grabbed my film camera, gone over to the fence, set up the camera, started filming, and it's a bit ironic considering my last video was about failing. I forgot to turn the microphone on and I didn't get any usable audio, so that footage was wasted. However, the opportunity to photograph some birds in flight was awesome, and I took lots of shots of these soft crested cockatoos flying around, and just using the eye tracking of the camera, I was able to track the cockatoos as it was flying, and you can see in all these frames here, just shot after shot, that it just sticks to that bird and tracks it all the way through the frame. And I managed to get the shot of the bird landing with some other birds, you can see that beautiful yellow under the wing, very, very happy with how that shot turned out. 
However, something started to become apparent to me that hadn't been that noticeable when I was using it on, a, um, on the gimbal and on a tripod. It was when I was using it handheld, I started to notice the viewfinder moving and I started to notice the rolling shutter in electronic mode. And when I talk about rolling shutter, I'm talking about the wobbling that you get in the images. And you'll see this for yourself if you've got this camera. As you can see in the sequence, we're getting shot after shot, but they start moving and they start warping. And that's really weird. And why is that happening? It all has to do with the readout speed of the R7 sensor. They're using that old sensor. I know it's updated, but it's ideal. It's technically a 90D sensor. The readout speed is very slow. So when we shoot an electronic, it's going from line to line to line, reading all these pixels to create the image. And if there's any movement during that time, you're going to get this warping effect. And I believe the readout speed of the sensor on the R7, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's over twice as slow as the R5. And it uses old technology, front side illuminated. The newer sensors from Fuji and Sony, they use this backside illuminated sensor. They don't suffer from the same rolling shutter that you'll get in this camera. Canon have almost forced a really old sensor into a mirrorless body. And my initial feelings after seeing this rolling shutter is it was a mistake. They should have created a backside illuminated sensor for this camera. So as I was driving up my driveway, I spotted the most beautiful birds we get visiting on this property. And those are turquoise parrots. These parrots are beautiful. The red face, the colors, I just had to have a go at photographing them. So I've actually just stopped the truck. I left the truck on, jumped out. I didn't film it. I just grabbed my camera, went after the birds, and I did actually get some of my best shots I've ever got of these turquoise parrots. Now these parrots generally feed on the ground, and you can see here in this shot the birds busy feeding. Uh, I re got reasonably close, but the detail here is excellent. I'm very happy with that. We also had a bird jump up onto a onto a branch and I managed to get some shots of it. This is the male with the blue head. Very, very happy with these shots. However, it's important that I discuss the failures I had photographing this bird and how the R7 really struggled. So I was using spot AF with eye tracking as I was in the morning. I had no issue with the water birds whatsoever. It stuck to those swans, those birds found them, no problem whatsoever. However, as soon as this bird was on the ground and we had grass involved and twigs and sticks, the focus struggled. For whatever reason, it was wanting to jump onto the grass, bird, grass, and it meant that I was getting a lot of out of focus shots. And this is a problem when you're using spot autofocus with tracking is because we lose traditional AF. I lose the spot autofocus that I can just put on the bird and then force it to focus on it. So as you can see in this shot, I actually missed probably be the best shot of the day. I had the turquoise parrot up on a rock, nice side profile, would have been awesome. But the damn camera just focused on the background. Super frustrating. I didn't have time to change it. The bird was gone, moment was lost. So I missed that shot because of the autofocus. Now, because I'm hand holding again, I'm gonna have those rolling shutter issues. I'm still an electronic, I don't wanna scare the birds away. So I'm shaky at the best of times. The birds are moving, I'm moving. And you'll see in this series of shots just how bad the rolling shutter is. So we can see the autofocus issues and the rolling shutter. So the bird is on a rock. I've pointed the camera, I've initiated the subject tracking. So I've tried to put the focus point on the bird and I've held down the button and it's just kept grabbing the background, the rock behind the bird. And you can see as we go through the shots, the rolling shutter takes into account and the image is going up and down. It's warping, it's going all over the place. Finally, the camera picks up the bird and we do get the shot. But in a series of shots, we shouldn't be having that many that are out of focus and we shouldn't be having to deal with that rolling shutter. It makes me wonder whether you can shoot an electronic handheld uh, long term. With that amount of rolling shutter, with a few of those autofocus issues, I'm suspecting that I may just go to mechanical mode. I may just go back to traditional spot autofocus when I need it and use eye tracking as well when I need it. Um, the only issue with mechanical mode is it's good that you get rid of the rolling shutter, but you get this sound. So, you know, it might scare the birds, you're limited to 15 frames per second, but you will eliminate rolling shutter. So, you know, that was interesting. I'm glad I got that opportunity to photograph those parrots because I wouldn't have known that otherwise. And that's why you have to really use a camera through multiple sessions to be able to do a proper review. And I'll do that later on. So what I might do now is just fully, just recap quickly my first impressions of the camera and I'll go through the things that you're mostly interested in. First one is the ISO. How did it perform in high ISO? As you would expect for a 30 megapixel APS sensor, at ISO 3200 and above, 
it was pretty noisy and you're going to have to use noise reduction software. Now you would have seen from the photos at the beginning of the session that I did actually get some usable shots at high ISO. So the Swan at ISO 6400, pretty happy with how this turned out, but I did use Topaz Denoise. Now you can use that already with the R7, um, just in Lightroom you can open up Denoise, you activate it and you can see by this slider that it does a pretty good job of removing that noise and once it's processed I'm pretty happy with the outcome. Now if you want to use Topaz Denoise yourself I have got a 15% off link in the description. It works really well and you will need noise reduction at 3200 and above on this camera so if you don't already have it perhaps look at that or wait for DxO Pure RAW which doesn't work with the R7 yet but I'm sure it will in the future. Right in terms of the buffer lots of questions about this and I will do a full video on ISO and buffer in the future. I was hitting the buffer consistently at 30 frames per second full raw, almost unusable to be fair. You can definitely do those little short bursts, but you're going to hit the buffer when it counts and you're going to be very frustrated. So I put it into C raw and it was better, but again I was still occasionally hitting the buffer. I think to avoid hitting the buffer altogether, you're just going to have to shoot at 15 frames per second and C raw and then you'll be fine. I don't think you'll have any issues hitting the buffer, but we will test that in the future. The image quality of the camera, I didn't have very good light, so I had overcast conditions almost all day and as a consequence the image quality is not going to be as good as if you have nice sunlight. So for the conditions I was happy uh, at those lower ISO, it worked better and overall very happy with how it performed as expected, I need to do some more testing and some better light. It's nowhere near the R5 quality, but we have to consider the price and what it is. All right, the usability of the camera. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan, to be honest. My first issue that I've got is that for whatever reason, I actually use my left eye to look through the viewfinder and not my right eye. So my left eye, which means my face is over here, and the thumb and the control wheel I've got my thumb and when I'm doing it I'm actually hitting myself in the nose with my thumb every time I'm moving the joystick which is a bit annoying it just feels a bit cramped in here so that's a bit of a pain and my thumb feels super awkward going over to the right hand side to initiate dual back button focus it's just quite awkward to be honest I'm, I'm not a fan I much prefer the R5 or the R6 so that'll take a little bit of getting used to um, it feels fine and uh, my hand you know my little finger I've got pretty small hands so they're not coming off the bottom. Overall not too bad but I prefer the layout of the R5 and the R6. Uh, the viewfinder, I don't have an issue with the viewfinder, it's a non-issue. Of course it's nowhere near as good as the R5 but you can see everything clearly, you can see the autofocus, you can see the bird, you can pick it up. Uh, sure it's a little bit crunchy, a little bit digital but it's not a deal breaker, it's not a reason I wouldn't buy this camera. So overall pretty happy with how it went. You know I did get some nice images but I need to do a lot more testing. I need to test it with other lenses, I need to get out in the field and better light and I will be doing that in coming up so stay tuned. Let me know in the comments if you're getting this weird wobble, if you're getting the rolling shutter, how bad is it for you in electronic, um, what are your feelings so far, what lenses are you using with it, what do you want to know. Uh, I do read the comments and I will answer those questions. Uh, thanks to the subscribers who obviously subscribe to the channel, the new members, welcome. If you're not aware for the small price of a, less than a coffee per month you can support the channel it helps me to continue making these videos buy these cameras to test etc so thanks again happy birding and we'll see you in the next one see ya. and i'm at 30 is it 30 frames per second whatever the highest frame rate is 30 yep all right so i'm also very so i'm also really interested so i'm also really interested in the i'm also really i'm really <laughs>